You're listening to Cosmic Tonic. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, let me say that again. <clears throat> Cosmic Tonic. Hi, thanks for tuning in to Cosmic Tonic. Today, we speak with our good friend, Anya Kotz, about the sign and archetype of Aries. If you like what we do, please leave us a five-star rating, write a review, or share the podcast with your friends. We appreciate it. And there's a couple different ways you can listen to us. On your favorite podcast app, or by subscribing to our YouTube channel. Thanks for being here and enjoy the show. Okay. There's so many Aries jokes, you guys. Oh my God. I mean, I'm a walking Aries joke. I know. (laughs) I was like, maybe we could just tell a whole podcast of jokes. Because we're always riffing on each other in that way. It's bad. But I would trade I would trade my Pisces moon for an Aries moon any day. At least, at least no you wouldn't cast. Oh my gosh. It would no, be such I'm a too, nice break. You will. I'm like the opposite. I was listening to one mm-hmm. of Anya's podcasts and I was like, oh my God, I'm that person that Whitney and Anya. Like I drive them crazy with all my Pisces, woo, spiritual fantasy, unicorn land. <laughs> I'm just glad I don't have a fire moon. That would be. A real bad time for me. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> totally <Yeah>. balanced. <laughs> I mean, with all the other stuff, it would just be like, uh, I don't know what you're talking know. about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that fire makes it's gets a lot it. done. <laughs> yeah. I have a lot of Aries, though. It's just in the eight, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you have in Aries? Jupiter, Chiron, all the cent- well, some centaur ladies and goddesses. I just keep thinking of that <laughs> CNC Music Factory song. Let's get this party started right. <laughs> Y'all you guys know that song from like forever ago? I don't even know how many years ago. That's what I think about when I think about Aries. <laughs> they just know how to start the party. Yeah. So That's the all we need to decans talk about. The party, <laughs> the Venus decans the party decan. Aries starts the party. <laughs> Pisces finishes it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. You guys want to get started? Okay. Let's do it. Yeah. Okay. So today we're talking about the sign and the season of Aries. And we are joined with one of our dear Aries rising friends, Anya Katz, who has been a friend to the podcast and a regular guest, or at least a repeat guest. And we've also, you know, played swapsies and guested on Anya's podcast, Millennium Sky to Saving the World. So we have enough Aries to balance out the Pisces moons on this show. I've got, I've got backup. <laughs> Um, So I thought that we could start, as we normally do, by exploring initially the the basic principles of Aries. So Aries is a fire sign, and it's a cardinal sign, which means it has this quality of initiating and starting, and it's like that that initial um, strike of the match that creates that flame. Not necessarily known for its staying power, but <laughs> I can leave. <laughs> I can leave real quick <laughs> when it's time. Um, there is, what am I missing? Um, yeah, it's, it's a more uh, diurnal sign. So a more, you know, some say masculine, some say diurnal or, or of the day sect. Um, yeah, so maybe we can start by you sharing your experience of your your Aries action, Anya. I know that's a major question, but to, to what extent do you identify with your Aries? 
Um, quite a bit, actually. I think learning that I was in Aries rising and that Mars ruled my chart was like maybe more revelatory than anything else. Um, I think I was very conscious of the fact that I like could identify what I wanted and do it. And like, there were a lot of people that always said like, how do you have the bravery to do this and that and this and that? And it felt very innate to me. (laughs) So the question in itself was confusing. Um, So once I found out that I was an Aries rising and, and I also have Mars in Aries. um, So that adds to it quite a bit. And, uh, um, and lot and a grand fire train, which involves that my ascendant. So there's a lot of it. And it really just helped me, I think, identify that power for myself that like, oh, okay, like you are that person that is brave enough to speak up. You are that person that can like think of an idea and create it. And that sort of became an ally um to me. And I and I have a Libra moon and, and struggled with a lot of like codependent stuff. So it was also a way to, for me to sort of eject myself from that in a way um, and just like take ownership of my autonomy and independence. So uh, yeah, it, it, I would say Mars guides me in pretty much like everything. <laughs> I feel sort of constantly communicating with my chart ruler in that sense. I mean, you tattoo your chart ruler onto your finger. I did. I, did. <laughs> I literally did. Yeah. So I, I got this tattoo <laughs> rather impulsively, <laughs> just on brand for Aries. Um, but yeah, I literally got it on my pointer finger as a way to sort of symbolize that it like pointed the way for me and got it on my um, left hand because I thought if I ever, I probably, I sort of knew I probably wouldn't get married or have a wedding ring on or and again, but to like balance the relational part of my life with the autonomous and independent part of my life, like having those on the same hand made sense. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, I very identified. Well, you said quite a few things there that I think we can dwell on in terms of being classic Aries qualities. There's the courage, there's the impulsiveness, there's the autonomousness. And I, yeah, I, I, I resonate with all of those as well with my Aries moon, but there, I think there is just a, um, you know, I always think of those cookbook astrology books that break Aries down into, or sorry, not Aries, they break the signs down into keywords or verbs and Aries is always something like act or action. Mm-hmm. But I do think there's so much wisdom actually in that connection. I feel that there's just no hesitation. There's no uh, waffling. There's not even time for self-doubt. It's like you do it and you apologize right. later <laughs> if you need to, <laughs> or you do it and you don't yeah. come back. Or you don't apologize. Yeah, I, <laughs> right. <laughs> or you don't sorry, think you have not, to. Sorry. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot of sorry, not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's my experience with yeah. Eliza. I think too like can be the charm don't you think I think that directness and that you know blazing the path and kind of yeah I just I really find those qualities very charming at times yeah and I think like (laughs) so many people for the most part are struggling with in action right and overthinking and um I think in general it's it's interesting to watch like there's so much weighing us down probably always but these days especially and I know for me personally like I have a Virgo south node and like and a Libra moon like there's a lot of capacity for me to dwell or to be indecisive or for me to not act um and I see that reflected I think especially in women as well like just that constant sort of self-doubt or self-deprecation or fear um and I think Aries and Mars is the antidote to that. It's like, mm-hmm. like you said, like it doesn't even allow you to do, go through that rumination. It's just like you're, mm-hmm. you, you didn't even realize and it's like already happening. I felt this when I launched this lunar circle program that I'm launching. Like I had the idea and launched it 
in like 72 hours <laughs> and was like, oh, okay, I guess I have to do it now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's that quick it's like it's it's like you don't even realize it's happened it's going so quickly all of my life altering decisions have been made in the instant of their inception <laughs> like, <laughs> so I remember <laughs> I remember because I was planning to be a lawyer my whole life and I was taking political science classes in my undergraduate and I was planning to go to law school and I literally woke up one day and was like, I, I'm going to try writing, actually. And I changed my, fa- I, that day, I changed my faculty to fine arts. I took my first writing class and I did not turn back. The same thing moved me to England. The same thing moved me to Montreal. It's just like, nah, I'm going to try this. <laughs> and then the course of your life is altered until you make another life altering decision. Um, but there's something in that. I, this actually came up in a conversation the other day, and I don't know exactly what uh, class or what article or what tweet was referenced, but I believe it was the People's Oracle who um, was talking about how if you look at at least the first part of Aries in the sidereal zodiac, it's in Pisces. And there's actually mm. a good deal of intuition that we can read into that ability to just act because you have that belief already that it's going to, that it, that this is the right decision. You have that trust. And there is something incredibly Piscean about that actually. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an interesting thing to contemplate that it's not just um, bullish and, you know, (laughs) recklessness. There can just be a, a trusting your gut, like knowing that this is the right thing in a given moment. Mm -hmm. It makes me think about the the nature of the Aries point and that 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 energy actually spans across the 29th degree of Pisces, the zero degree of Aries into the first degree. And that's exactly what you're talking about is like carrying that intuition over and that energy that it takes to finish something is the same energy that it takes to start something. Uh Mm hmm. Yeah, I think there's a very intimate relationship with Pisces. I mean, I think even in the sense of like, sort of coming from that Piscean world and like, you sort of have a memory of it. But at the same time, there's this sense of like, I need to protect myself in order to survive. It's like you get so sucked into and drowned (laughs) by, you know, Neptune. Um, And I think Aries is sort of a reaction to that, but it certainly isn't a neglect of that and then it certainly doesn't forget where it's been so there's Mm -hmm. this I don't know there's sort of this like Saturn and joy and Pisces feel to me it's like how do we take that realm the spiritual realm and like bring it into a body you know and like Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, protect one's energy and I have a lot of Pisces heavy friends so it's interesting to reflect on like where the uh, the sponge ends <laughs> like the right. the boundary needs to begin you know um so yeah I like I like thinking about that transition a lot well it's funny because the bound ba- when we when you say the word boundary I often think of earth signs yeah. um, I think of physical walls and it's with Aries that's not the case the boundary is movement in a way it's or what the only thing that's stopping you from sort of wallowing or um that emotional inertia is just action it's just getting on with it (laughs) which has been you know my like personally speaking that's been my probably one of my greatest blessings but also a major challenge because I don't it's very hard for me to linger in moments or feelings of discomfort And when I'm engaged in those experiences of discomfort with other people and I want to move on faster than they do, that's its own discomfort. (laughs) I'm like, why, why haven't you forgiven me yet? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Which is interesting about like the Aries relationship to conflict. I mean, and maybe this is my Libra moon seeping in, but I don't, I don't think Aries wallows in the conflict I think it's like there's no wallowing there's no wallowing yeah (laughs) it's not like they seek out conflict it's very it's like the conflict is just a way to like get to the new thing 
and then it's like very quickly resolved. Like I, I go from like, I'm really angry to like, I don't, uh, it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> like very, Me too. very quick. Yeah. <laughs> Like you need to just expel that fire. Like the felt heat in your body, you just need to expel in some angry words or a raised voice. Right. And then it's done. It's all good. But then the other person is wounded and you have to tend to that. <laughs> well, the Aries doesn't operate from a place of fear either. And I think that's such a huge part of the archetype. And it, there's so much potential for success in that. It's just getting over fears and just moving through them and that's what I see a lot with with you Eliza and, you, and especially you Anya too with all your accomplishments over the last couple of years it's just watching that is there's not there's not that element you know of of overthinking like you were saying earlier Anya right in that process maybe you guys could talk a little bit about that about how you your relationship to fear and how you you think about it yeah I, I use a quote all the time that says um courage isn't the absence of fear it's just fear walking uh, mm. and I think that's key because I think what confused me for a long time in talking about this archetype within myself was that I, there isn't the absence of fear like I am human I I do have some degree of fear of failure or even a fear of my potential um but there's something in my life where I don't know it's like evolve or die it's like you can't allow the fear to keep you stuck um so it's sort of this integration of fear and I feel like the fear is actually used I mean you can think about this I think in the um like expression of Aries as warrior or something right it's like how can we use the fear as fuel almost it's like a manic kind of quality of like I feel this energy in body and I feel like I don't know what's gonna happen and I'm gonna use that unease kind of or that that energetic um internal movement to to mm -hmm. go mm-hmm um so yeah there's I don't know it's I definitely don't yeah I don't feel that sort of like terror of of movement or making a decision or launching yeah. something or doing a podcast um at least not in the sense that it stops me um you know and it's it's a practice thing I think that's a lot of the the case too it's like let's say I have all this Mars energy which enables me to utilize the fear in an active way. And then I use it and I see that I don't like die and that like the world doesn't end, you know, because maybe I made a mistake or I wasn't perfect. And then that the fact that I keep doing it over and over and over again, that becomes the marker. Like, like I know, well, I did this before and it was fine. So like, it'll be fine this time, you know, and you keep using the practice as like more evidence that it'll be fine no matter what happens. Um, you make an interesting point about the unease and how it comes up and it begs the question to me, do you even call it fear? Is fear even the right word to describe how you're feeling? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, now I feel like, I'm like, do I feel fear? What does fear feel like? <laughs> <laughs> well, you said you're a yeah. normal human being and you experience fear, but yeah. it's it it's it seems in what you were saying that there's more of a an an, an ease or maybe um, a touch of anxiety, and it might not really go to the extreme that we see fear in its normal context. If that makes any sense, as far as how right. an Aries operates in that realm of there's a there's a spectrum right yeah when it comes right. to fear so right and it just yeah, might not be like as extreme yeah right yeah that's true yeah I mean I certainly like I feel nervous right like if I'm about to teach a class or I'm gonna go on a podcast not this one because I know you guys but like or I'm gonna interview a guest I really admire and I'm like really there's definitely nerves. There's definitely like shortness of breath. And um, I would say that that's a little bit fearful in nature, I guess. Um, 
but it's also energizing, you know, like I just, it just, uh, I don't know, it, it flows through my body in a way where it doesn't stagnate me or prevent me or mm. make me not able to speak. It's like, I recognize it, I see it. <laughs> and once I start whatever the thing is that I was nervous about, it normally will subside a little bit. Um, and certainly I get you know, emotionally triggered by things where I'm very fearful in sort of an almost subconscious way, you know, that in that case, I don't know how much my Mars stuff works to, to snap me out of some sort of like emotional terror. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's definitely there. But yeah, the, the like, you know, the kind of normal stage fright stuff that people get or the perfectionist stuff, I would say that's very low for me. It sounds like a superpower almost. And I think a lot about that is like, how do we transmute the anxiety or the unease or the fear into the excitement or the catalyst? And it also seems really indicative of how much we care and how much something means to us mm. as well. And then it kind of, I don't know, sort of starts to highlight that calling of the hero's journey as well. Yeah, error. I think is a really good word for Aries, like knowing what you desire to begin with, like that in and of itself, I think is an Aries thing, let alone then going to get it. But like, oh, I want that. Okay, now let's figure it out, you know? Um. Well, one word that I think is relevant to bring in that's sort of a facet of fear is self-doubt. And I think that's actually what Aries has some mastery of. Like if you think of how Aries represents the self, there's no, there's nothing else yet. It's that, it's that initial kernel of being and there's nothing else <laughs> if we're talking archetypally. So the, there is nowhere else for the, that self doubt to come because there's nothing else. And again, I'm speaking very archety archetypally and metaphorically here, but I think that, and I'm not saying that Aries people don't experience self doubt at all, but I, I do think that there is more of an instinct to mobilize and any experience of fear will be more likely to be mobilizing than stymieing. So when you, when you experience those nerves, when you experience that moment of like, Oh God, I really hope this goes well. I don't know if this is going to go well, that it gets you, it, you know, I, I imagine an athlete having nerves on game day, but like it's what pushes you to go even that much faster it's, you know, that, ha that opens your adrenaline channels and actually can right. cause you to perform really well. Mm -hmm. Even if your body experiences a little fearful, <laughs> you know, fearful, but, but pumping adrenaline, it's mm -hmm. like, if you imagine two of those, you know, a circumstance where you're physically threatened and then having the adrenaline maybe to bolt or having the adrenaline to fight back in a certain moment. Like that to me also feels very Aries. Like it's not so much about fear not existing. It's just what, what happens next. And I think it has something to do with action and mobilization. Mm -hmm. And do you think like, like I, I think confidence has to play into this as well. Right. Because if you go, if you're like, okay, I'm feeling fearful. Like what's the worst that could happen is like some sort of failure of whatever the task is. And I think that's another thing that people with a lot of Mars or Aries feel okay about. It's like, I know I'm going to do okay. Like, I don't, like, I might mess up a little, you know, I, I might forget to, like, I did a, a book club, like, um, group meeting with my podcast listeners, my patrons, and I, I record it so that the people who aren't there can watch it and it's like it might seem silly but I've like felt really I forgot I just totally forgot to record it and it's like okay that's sort of a failure in some way but like I know I'll just think of a creative way to solve for that to have a second book meeting you know and record that one and like next time I won't do that and let's just keep it is it's movement through like one I don't think I'm gonna fail I have pretty much like some confidence that this will do okay and even if I do even if something goes wrong I know I'll be able to sort of constructively solve for it in a way that won't make me feel you know like totally debilitated by mm. whatever the quote-unquote mm. failure was well it sounds like it's sort of the path of realizing how capable you are and that we are 
equipped or maybe the path of the Aries is initiating that because you were saying earlier on how you lean into it or you continue to face what comes up and the other side of the coin is really that it turns out okay and you're not going to die as a result. And I think that's really important, right? Because that other energy of the wallowing or the Pisces, you know, we need that energy to accomplish anything in our lives. And I just see so many parents, for example, with my clientele, letting their kiddos opt out of that anxiety. And it's just making a bigger monster Mm. of it, you know, and not facing it. And then you don't have the tools. So there's just such potent wisdom in it as well. And truth, like I find Aries people really so true. And there's also an innocence about you guys as well. It's a, it's like a childlike quality at the beginning of the Zodiac that I just really appreciate. Yeah. I love the image of the, like the bud popping up through the concrete. It just like, doesn't give a fuck. It's just like, <laughs> I'm going to live. And like, that's, there's so much power in that. And that just like drowns out so much noise when the will to live is sort of the overwhelming, you know, and that, and that's encompassing of everything, you know, that's encompassing of heartache or encompassing of failure, encompassing of hard feelings. Um, But there's just a will to live and be alive that, yeah, is, is pure. And um, yeah, I agree. There's a childlike uncomplicated nature to it for sure. I want to say too for people listening that a lot of these qualities are qualities of Mars and I, I imagine it's hard to distinguish because you have Mars in its sign of domicile on your ascendant or at least in your first house so you have like extra <laughs> extra areas or extra Mars represented but I imagine I get, there could be some people who are listening to this who actually identify with some of these archetypes and even if they don't have prominent Aries they might have Mars on the ascendant or they might have Mars prominently placed or Mars conjunct the sun and I think that you know it's interesting how astrology can work that way sometimes the planets themselves can transfer those qualities that we associate with signs if those planets are prominently placed in the chart yeah or like Mars exalted in Capricorn I feel like is yeah very Mars but it's yeah but it's a different energy isn't it than it's mars a different and aries energy. it's yeah it's, it's more... more constructive <laughs> <laughs> it takes more planning like i always i love how um t and chang often she often talks about the five of of pentacles or five of discs card which is uh represented by mercury and taurus and it's the lord of of worry it often indicates financial concerns or financial worry but she often says that the flip side of worry is planning and that planning can actually be a way to make that worry more constructive and I feel like I feel like Mars and Capricorn I'm not sure that Mars and Aries is known for its planning that's probably coming from other parts of your chart possibly but I feel like Mars and Capricorn plans yeah well or like it has more to show for itself like I think of it being very I feel like every contractor I've ever known has Mars and Capricorn like it's very practical in its yeah. use you know for me sometimes I feel like I'm just like running around like a fireball or something but um <laughs> in an earth sign <laughs> Mars <laughs> like yeah I don't know but but for sure I mean there's there's going to be different expressions of it wherever it is um yeah well, and I'd love to talk to you about like, I'm reading, I don't know, Kestrel, if you started it yet, but I'm reading this really great book called Existential Kink. Um, and it's about basically trying to like, see our, see our shadow as something to be kind of turned on by, like stop trying to push away so much. And she talks about, um, can I actually read a portion of it? Please. Okay. Yes. Okay. It's so good. <laughs> I'm only in the first okay, chapter. So, <laughs> yeah, I, this is pretty early on. So she's talking about um, the great work, basically. So the work of becoming a magical force in nature is very much connected to what the alchemist called the great work. Um, the first major stage of the great work was known to alchemists as the unio mentalis, the creation of a unified mind. The unio mentalis is a being that is not in conflict with itself 
it's undivided and thus ex is extremely powerful. It's important to note that the unio mentalis isn't just nice to have for mystical reasons, it's also highly pragmatic. Unio mentalis is synonymous with having a united will, what in ancient Greece considered the absolute precondition to effectical magic, or in other words, the deliberate generation of positive sickness experiences. And I feel like that, like unifying one's will is the difference between like the shadow, I think, expression of Mars and like the healthy or, or Aries and the, the healthy mature expression of it. It's like how complete is our self-identification and self-awareness. And if it's incomplete, um, then I think we see a lot of the shadow expressions of like the Aries archetype. Uh, so yeah, I think it's interesting to think about the the self-knowledge piece of Aries too. Um, Cause I think that's really where it does sort of, I mean, that's fascinating, right? Like if you, if we talk about manifestation, it's like there is actually a lot of action, I think, mm -hmm. in 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 getting what you want. You know, it's identifying it and believing that it's possible. But then, like, what are those those actions that need to be taken? And I think for a uh, Aries person, there is a, and maybe that relates back to the Pisces thing. But there's like a magical quality to that. It's very pure. Well, and alchemy needs that catalyst mm -hmm. like anything that is transmuted or transformed needs that cardinal fire and this is so like I'm so loving this book so far too because it's got me thinking about that self work like there's so many ways to conceptualize shadow work and of course the shadow itself is was I think coined by Carl Jung but then um you know, getting to the self requires having conversations with all the different parts of ourselves, including the shadow. And it's not so much to exile it or push it away, but how can we integrate those opposite polarities to really get to that self-guided place where it's kind of holding the umbrella for everything else, mm -hmm. Um yeah, I don't know exactly where I'm going with all that, but I do feel like the path of Aries to a huge extent is individuation and being able to be self-guided. It's so interesting because that phrase, um, that expression, the unified will, I don't consider Mars a unifier. Like we often associate Mars with separation, but the, the will is unified because it's one, it's singular. It's, it doesn't need uniting. It already, you know, it already is. It already is. Completely. <laughs> so um, that's, but that's a really, I mean, I, I love what you read. That makes me want to read that book just as a side note. But secondly, um, maybe that's a segue to talking about, about some of the shadow of Aries and Mars. Because I think there can be a self-focus. There can be, well, I don't think there's anything wrong with self-focus but there can be a self-absorption that, that then uh, spills from being really focused on your own work, on your own path. Um, I think there can be, I, you know, I, I've said this on, the, on this podcast and maybe even on yours, Anya, a few times, but like the classic for me <laughs> when it become a when when it can become shadow or um, a blind spot is just in my physical carriage through the world and like if I'm walking really fast on the street and I can make a I make a game of it if I'm at the airport I am competing with every other body I see to get to the luggage carousel first to get to <laughs> the customs lineup first to avoid the lineup I am like <laughs> truly just calculating and walking faster and, you know, cutting people off, but in an elegant way so I don't actually touch them, but they probably feel violated. <laughs> I feel so called out. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, there's, it's a game and it's fun yeah. and it's, you know, I love the economy and the efficiency of it. However, <laughs> I have been, and I think I have shared this before, I have been, I have been called out on it. I remember walking down the street with my friend and I, 
did cut someone off, but I didn't touch them. I knew exactly what I was doing. I had, I knew I had time to cross their path and wiggle out of their body room. And my friend just stopped and was like, Eliza, what the fuck? You just totally cut that person off. <laughs> and I, I was like, I knew what I was doing. I didn't touch her, but it still had an effect probably on that person who just saw this like bolt of mass barreling past her. <laughs> so I think that can, I think that that can be one of the shadow sides is that in all of our movement and all of our rushing and all of our action and all of our decisiveness, we don't always consider other people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit like have blinders on, you know, it's just like you have one destination. Yeah, I definitely, it's funny. I always, for people, when I used to give readings, I would talk about, like, I would always talk about how I think the rising sign is how you move down the street, <laughs> like how you walk on the sidewalk. <laughs> um, yeah. And I definitely do a lot of, um, yeah. And I, I think, I mean, I've, I've also been thinking a lot for any of the signs, like that before, like that the shadow is so external that like, I feel like a healthy, mature expression of anything comes when like it's integrated into oneself. Um, and I think Aries, because we're talking about the body and we're talking about the self, that's particularly relevant. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think so. I think for a long was, I was squashing the Aries stuff in me. Like I was, I was very self-conscious. I mean, and I'm a Leo and there was a point at which I became extremely self-conscious of like performing of like, I'm, this is too much. I'm talking too much. I'm interrupting people. I'm trying to be the center of attention there. And that became, it became very Virgoan and it's sort of like, you're horrible for doing that kind of a thing. Um, and I've, you know, e leveled that out a little bit now but I think it was so external for a while and a lot of like outbursts of anger I think is a very potential Aries thing like if Aries is not taking care of itself and protecting itself and honoring itself it will just lash out because like that energy you know, and how does that energy stagnate in the body too, you know, like that's really unhealthy. If there's that much e energy, action oriented <laughs> energy that's being swallowed or, you know, being overshadowed by some sort of like codependent thing, it's not being expressed. It's like, you know, there's also the health issue component with mm -hmm. Mars. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'll literally break out in hives like that happens to me, which is very martial. I'm very Mars, like I think Mars is associated with inflammation and with redness. Yeah. yeah I and got I, an acne. Like that's my thing. Like, it's <laughs> like, okay. It's so literal. And Aries rules the adrenal glands too. So I was actually going to bring that up with Kestrel. Cause I know that you talk a lot about the physical body and how the archetypes show up in your practice and I was wondering if you wanted to kind of go into that a little bit and how how the adrenal glands play such an important role in this archetype and thinking about it especially when it comes to burnout because I think that's a huge part of the shadow of Aries is the potential for burnout mm -hmm. well there's that I'm um like that boundless energy too. And at what point does it get exhausted? Yeah. And I, mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of this has been said in some ways already with that, the nervous system and the fight flight or freeze. And then also that discharge that Eliza was referring to is it does need a release valve and, you know, we're so equipped in our bodies to discharge and yet it gets so tamped down everything from, you know, speaking incessantly or more loudly, sweating, crying, shaking, trembling like I think those are really useful ways to to help people um relieve that energy I mean obviously in a safe container I mean there's those moments where that's impulsive there's that impulsive um, impulsivity <laughs> 
but, or an explosion. And sometimes that's the only way it can come out. But on the other hand, I think we, I personally can really help clients um, find a safe place to express that energy. It needs to be seen. It needs to be witnessed, right? If not, it does lead to other issues inside the body or, you know, the pent upness, and then it really lashes out and does harm. It can be really hurtful and not considering of others emotions or the impact, not having that mind side of how one's actions um, do negatively affect others. Right. So. And the importance of physical exertion with this archetype and exercise, exercise. is so huge, especially for children. When I see Mars and Aries in children's charts and a lot of times, and you can probably speak to this Kestrel, they're you know, categorize or misdiagnose as having certain type of mental illness, especially like ADD and stuff like that. And if they have Mars and Aries in their chart and the parents aren't necessarily thinking on that level that it could be the child just needs more physical activity and physical exertion in order to, to feel whole and to feel balanced. It's a, it can be a real issue or problem for small children with this. Yeah. 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 Well, and helping kiddos to emotionally reg- regulate too. Like they're mm-hmm. not designed, their upstairs and downstairs brains are not connected. That rational and emotional mind's not connected. And I think that's another piece of Aries is learning emotional regulation. Um, mm-hmm. And we as adults really have to take that deep breath <laughs> when a kid is raging and hold the container and space for that, for that energy to be discharged before we try to rationalize with them or have some sort of conversation. I'm not saying don't have the conversation, but with those big emotions, sometimes we just have to get down on their level and help them soothe it. And then we can have some insight or consequences or problem solving after on the other side. Yeah, I think that was very me as a child. I had basically like severe colic from like the moment I started eating solid food. I know, I guess breastfeeding, going home from the hospital is when it started. Um, And so many fits of rage. I mean, I would throw like the biggest temper tantrum on the planet because like the seams of my socks weren't like lined up in the way that they were, you know, (laughs) which might be some of the Virgo coming in there, but it was like, it was really, I mean, I was, it was intense. And I think, I think a lot of it was treated as it wasn't like, okay, go out and run around. I mean, my dad would do this sometimes. Like sometimes I'd throw a fit in a restaurant or something and he would be like, go outside and like do whatever you need to do. You you can do that. It's fine. You can scream and cry and do whatever. You just can't do it in here. <laughs> you can't do it in the fucking chilies. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> like go out in the vestibule. Um, and I, I think too, I've noticed later in life that a lot of that energy can be channeled creatively. Mm-hmm. Like, I, like Eliza just left me a message about, I mean, grand fire trends in general, but like, what is it if not constantly managing burnout, you know, like Mm -hmm. there's a capacity and that used to like, that used to mess me up because I didn't know what the limit was there. Um, So I just kept doing it and kept doing it and didn't know how to stop or when to stop or, and now I sort of see it as like, you know, I can create something like something artistic or like a course or a podcast or something or many podcasts Um, and it really, the only way I'm satisfied is like, I work just up until the point of burnout, but not quite. So I can like wake up the next day and do it again, you know, but there's something kind of invigorating in the, the heavy, heavy energy and focus there. Um, and a kid, you know, I think it is a lot more bodily and a lot more physical and there isn't that same capacity to like sit down and create a project as a way to get that energy out uh and I think I was like over scooped I think I really should have been told to just like go run uh, run around and get it out not stop or um Mm -hmm. calm down yeah or be medicated yeah right (laughs) it's like yeah and this is like a whole other attachment conversation but yeah I just we can really use that outlet, physical outlet, the somatic body stuff. 
And I've seen it in the the exam rooms with like two year olds having their terrible two tantrums, like literally running and throwing themselves at the doors and on the floor. And the parents are just like, oh, and I'm like, well, maybe try not to chuckle out loud, but just hold the space. (laughs) It's going to be okay. (laughs) And just that energy, it's so much, it's so intense. (laughs) Yeah, I resonate with all of that too. My, um, for me, like when I was a child, I mean, I definitely, you know, I was the most calm and quiet baby. I was silent to the point where my parents were a little forget how quiet I was. Um, but as soon as my brother was born <laughs> and I had competition, like that's what sparked my own terrible twos. But for me, like, it was like with my dad, I would just clash with my father. But learning but astrology was so eye-opening because my dad has Venus in Aries on the exact degree of my moon. And he also has or had a moon in Aries as well, but later, later in the sign. So we were like actually each other's little point of fire <laughs> where we could actually use each other to discharge. <laughs> now, as a child versus as a grown man, there's obviously an uneven dynamic there, but it was one reason why we were so close. And also like there were, there were times where I think my dad was really worried about our relationship where he even, I remember suggested like getting counseling for us. And that for me was like, oh shit, (laughs) I'll stop yelling at you then. (laughs) I don't, that, that just made it too real. But, you know, I find that actually looking at the astrology of your family, if you have, especially if you have birth times at your disposal, which is a huge privilege, not everyone will have that for their parents, but Um, or for themselves even, but it can be so illuminating to see who, who actually activates your placements. Because if you have a parent with a personal planet or any planet on your moon or on your sun or on the degree of your ascendant, you might see some fireworks. So you might see like a well of emotion there. It's just an interesting exercise. Is there any Aries in your family, Anya? There isn't a lot. I was just actually like, I'm going to pull up all their charts. Um, there's definitely, I think, a fair amount of fire and Mars. Um, I think I'm a little bit unique in the the Aries stuff. My brother does have Mercury in Aries, I believe, and maybe something else, um, which is definitely <laughs> makes a lot of sense. I think... Um, I sort of saw a lot of my like pent up Mars energy, which manifested in health issues, like my brother and the verbal sparring kind of stuff um, was definitely present and, and something that we interacted a lot. Um, And I think my dad has a pretty forget. um, Yeah. I'm not prepared for this question. Um, But I, I think it's, I think I have most of it. Um, and I think my brother, I mean, I think both, all of my, like, there's a lot of Leo too. They're like, my brother and my dad are both Leo. So there was a lot of themes around like courage and bravery and like doing what you set out to do. I feel like that was definitely exemplified me for me in a myriad of ways. Um, that, you know, ability to recognize again, what you want and the capacity to get it. I definitely think that was taught to me and something I picked up on. Um, uh, But certainly not actually something I got from my mom at all. Um, I don't think my mom has a lot of Aries. Um, So yeah, I think it was, it was frustrating for a while. I think especially with my mom, we like she was totally at a loss as to how to manage that energy <laughs> in me. And it was hyper, hyper triggering for her. Um, so yeah, I mean, a big part of my like Saturn return journey was um, sort of also recognizing that I had no idea how to self soothe. And also that like soothing, maybe soothing wasn't the right choice all the time. Like, I had to really allow myself to, like, just allow the emotion to to move through me. Um, And that that was something that was new. (laughs) 
Like I, I was very quick to be like, I need, this isn't acceptable. You know, this is too much. I need to, I need to swallow it. Um, which manifested in like outbursts of rage and health issues and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, it definitely took a long time for me to get a handle on it. <laughs> Maybe this is a good segue to talk about the lunations because this full moon and Libra is happening in your seventh house of relationships. <laughs> Speaking of family and everything else that's happening, have you thought about how that's going to show up for you? Yeah. Um, I mean, I hadn't thought a ton about it until um, we were talking about talking about it. Um, but I do think for me, like this whole shadow integration thing is playing a very prominent theme in my life and not that it hasn't before but I feel like it's taken a little bit of a different tone it's become less conceptual and more like okay I feel like maybe I can actually start to do this in a real way um and it's interesting to um like look at the, pe- the piece with Chiron there I mean I would love to even just talk about Chiron and Aries right now um like, especially as the response to Uranus being in Aries for so long, I think there's a lot of collective themes around, like, I see this, I think, related to social media, too. It's like, people are like, what were we doing? Like, what were we doing <laughs> for seven years? You know, like, Uranus going into Aries when Instagram was launched and stuff. Just this, like, really sort of unintentional, unaware identification with and promotion of oneself and I think we're starting to see the the effects that that's had and the healing that needs to take place on Mm -hmm. that around like who are we really like and who is it that we're showcasing on the internet and how can we sort of disclose a more complete human (laughs) honest person um so I I see that reflected in my own life as well um but really like yeah there's a healing of self I think that feels present for me and I think the the unification of like self-awareness for me like identifying like I just I can't stop talking about this like above ground below ground like conscious subconscious self right and I've I've noticed how triggered I am by people who I feel like it's not matching up the person they're acting like the things they're saying there's something energetically that I'm attuned to that's like there's something else going on there like you're not you're being too agreeable like you're where's the conflict like where's the discomfort where's the insecurity um and I think I'm 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 dealing with that with other people. I'm experiencing with other people, but in the process, I'm really trying to like get a hold on that myself, right? What are the parts of me that are operating with outside of my mm-hmm. awareness control? Like where am I triggered? Where am I being where am I projecting? Um, and so I see the upcoming lunations, I feel like, um, in Aries and Libra as intensifying the focus on that for me, especially with Chiron being there um and Ceres and Venus to some degree <laughs> right <laughs> it's a lot um yeah and obviously like how can that you know I'm in a partnership romantic friendships they have like how all of that stuff plays a role in your relationship so prominently and it's you know I feel very very dedicated and have since my Saturn return experience of like walking the talk. Um, And I sort of see every time that I like step up in a way, like I take my, like, okay, like now you're going to teach people astrology. And then like with that comes this like crisis of identity in terms of like Mm -hmm. something I wasn't totally conscious of that needs to be integrated or dealt with or like just focused on. Um, so to me, there's a lot of that. It's like being asked to step up in my commitment in relationship, which then correlates to becoming more unified in my self-awareness. Um, yeah, you said a lot there and it is, um, it is a mega, (laughs) it is a mega full moon. So just to, 
just to clarify for the audience, the full moon in Libra will happen on March 28th at eight degrees of Libra. And on that day, the sun, so that's the other side of the full moon, the sun in Aries is more or less exactly conjunct Venus and also Chiron at eight degrees of Aries. We also have, and I mentioned this because Mars is the ruler of Aries, we also have Mars exactly on the North Node at mm-hmm. four, at 14 Gemini. So that feels relevant as well. I, I often see the North Node as being this amplifier or something that's just making those qualities bigger. So it feels like the ruler of the sun, so the ruler of all the Aries action is itself being expanded or swelled or inflamed by that, by the North Node. So, um, you know, on a collective level, I'm curious what will unfold. It's a few degrees from my moon, so I'm also curious <laughs> what's going to happen on a personal level. But um, it to me, it does seem, especially because we have Venus and Mars as sign, we have Venus in Aries. It does seem to be like a calling, a call to balance some of those sides of self and other of um, mm-hmm. self-focus and also concern for other people. There seems a natural actual, a, a natural balance there with, with this coming full moon. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's also so interesting to note it's two days after the superior conjunction of Venus with the sun, right? And she's making that transit on the outside of the sun furthest away from us. And I always... These aren't original ideas. I think Austin Coppock's talked about it this way and also Gray Crawford, but that more celestial like um, transmission being pulled in. And I think of the beloved, and I think it was actually Austin Coppock that mentioned on the astrology podcast that he was saying, what face will the beloved wear for this cycle coming into the moon? And I think of the beloved as other, but it's also truly the self. And so I just wonder, moving into this lunation, if there's some sort of meditation we can all do around what's being seated for this next cycle of self and other. And Chiron being there too, obviously lending a hand. Yeah. Yeah. And I think people are so heavily focused on finding the relationship and like having that be like, I want this to be evolved and spiritual and transcendent and all this stuff. And there isn't as much focus on, like I have a friend who recently met someone and it seems like this might be like a step up for her as far as her relationships go, like a more intentional, more aware, more adult relationship. And she said something in a message to me like, well, so here we go. I guess I'm going to have to deal with a bunch of stuff that I didn't plan on dealing with. And I I responded to her and I was like, I don't know, I'm going to call bullshit on that because like, I think, I mean, maybe you are not super aware of it, but like we, how can we possibly have the evolved, transcendent, amazing relationship without doing the inner work, you know? And I think there's that whole um, thing around like we are wounded in relationship and we heal in relationship, but that no, that is one maybe because like you're in a healthy partnership where you finally feel love and acceptance and you feel seen and you feel all these amazing things. But I think the healing is also going to be within oneself, at, you know, using that person as the mirror. And to me, I see this lunation as very sort of focused on the self in that regard. Um, less Libra, more Aries, <laughs> like deal with yourself to come here like you can't get here until you deal with yourself um and hopefully we're in relationships or we have friends or we have partners who can hold us and support us through that sometimes it's really icky you know it's a lot easier to point your finger at the partner and be like you made me feel like this than it is to be like I'm triggered so why am I triggered and like let's go into myself and my own past and Um, yeah, I think, I I don't know, there's a lot of rhetoric, I think, especially in like, Instagram therapy world around partners holding this like, super safe container for you. And I think that's necessary, like you need to be coming from a place of safety, like the ground level needs to be like, I feel safe and secure. But 
I think we need to be challenged a little bit more. Yeah. Okay, you're having a freak out. Like, I get that this thing sparked it, but it's not about the thing. Like, we have to understand that those intense moments of trigger are our own material. Um, And so I see, I don't know, this lunation but also just Chiron's passage through Aries to some extent it's like really calling us to deal with our own material and that can be supported by a partner but it's not meant to be like squashed by the partner in that person's sort of like overwhelming support and safety you know like challenge yourself a little bit like dig a little deeper go to a place that's like you have to go to a place that's uncomfortable I think in order to actually grow um so yeah i think i think there's a lot of that for us in um looking at ourselves more honestly and such powerful aries words right like challenging the self confronting the self and and also um the self being a self haven to some extent too, right? Like it is cool to have that self in other relationship, but i do think a lot of the great work does happen alone and we cannot expect the partner to do the work or acquiesce or just bend over. Um, I think that would be a great disservice Mm. to this path. Such wisdom from both of you. No, I think those are (laughs) on. Yeah. I heard her podcast. (laughs) I think that all, everything that you've brought up Anya and also that you've just spoken to Kestrel is, it feels extremely relevant to this coming full moon. Mm-hmm. Should we switch to the new moon? So that will be happening on April 11th um, at 21. Oh, wait, is that, is it 21 22. or 22? Okay, 22. Yeah. At 22 degrees of Aries. Um, which is sextiling our friend Mars <laughs> in mm-hmm. Gemini at 22, at 22 Gemini. What do you, do any of you have thoughts on that new moon? Mm. It it feels less obvious than the full moon in that the full moon had all of these exact degree pileups. This one feels a little more neutral. We do have Venus still in the picture. Venus is combust. So Venus isn't doing too well at this point because it's very close to the rays of the sun, but also in her sign of um, detriment. So I feel like um, Venus is is rearing to, or waiting to get into Taurus at this stage. But um, yeah, I don't know. What are your What are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, I'm just also noticing Mercury's then moved out of Pisces yeah. into Aries. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of Aries. There's a yeah. lot of Aries yeah. <laughs> action. Well, yeah, I was going to say, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, I was just going to bring up the Mercury thing too. You know, I wonder like, what is the, <clears throat> what like has come to fruition to some extent, like during that sort of like full moon crisis, perhaps. Um, that then like once you integrate and once you process can be communicated in a sort of a little bit less intense kind of a way a little bit more focused and using that mercury more as balance and less as outburst um like allowing it out right like communicating the thing um i think that's a big part of aries in general is like i mean certainly mercury in aries but like how are you expressing (laughs) this stuff for yourself and part of that i think self-awareness is about being able to talk about it and talk to your partner about it and talk to whomever about it um being brave enough to do so I don't know that was just my initial thought yeah well and it's interesting too because it's taking place in the last decan of Aries rule or like Venus's place in that decan so it does like there's some completion I feel even though it's a new moon beginning that whatever you know, gets expressed or awareness comes up, then maybe it can be used for the next cycle of growth. That Mm -hmm. just 
came to mind. Or we could have a party. <laughs> it is, isn't it the, is that what you're saying, Castro? Like the, this deacon associates with the four of wands, which is mm-hmm. the card we associate with completion. I, I, I'm reading right now, um, Susie Chang's 36 secrets. And I love how she creates a parallel between completion and consecration. Mm-hmm. And there's this idea that there can be this moment where we've um, created the talisman or we've created the tool and then we almost need, we need to purify it and we purify it through fire partly. So there's mm-hmm. like this element of making it pure and worthy of use, but it's also like a ritualistic celebration. There is, there is a celebration, there is a party in a way. Mm-hmm. There is a bit, but there's also a burning off of, in, of impurities. So, yeah, I find that uh, yeah, the four of wands is a, is a um, a lovely card, and it feels appropriate to connect it to this deacon of Aries. Um, also, I was thinking about what you were saying, Anya, in regards to Mercury, and I just think that it goes back to that whole theme of being decisive. Like Mercury rules the mind in so many ways and just being decisive or incisive with your speech, with not, with not waffling, with just kind of being able to commit to a decision. Um, to me, that really does speak to that, that Mercury and Aries archetype. Yeah. And there's this, I mean, there's a sextile with Mars and Jupiter as well um, in air. And so it's, you know, we can think about like the air either helping to like blow out the fire or making it stronger too (laughs) and sort of like is this is this a fusion or an intensification um and I'm sure it can sort of go both ways but yeah like allowing that sort of fire to be released into (laughs) the atmosphere (laughs) in a way um I think it's important to note too the sun is going to be hovering around it's to degree of exaltation at 19 degrees. So the opportunity to really purify, like you were saying, Eliza, during that time within that three day window is gonna be the best time all year <laughs> to use to utilize the sun's energy in that way. So mm, I like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good point. Maybe this is a good place to draw our conversation down to a close, unless there's anything we're missing. Are we missing anything? Mm -hmm. I feel good. I feel like I'm ready to start the party. (laughs) (laughs) Let's go. (laughs) So where can people find you, Anya? Um, They can find me at Anya Koss, A-N-Y-A-K-A-A-T-S dot com or on Instagram, Anya.Kotz. And as mentioned, I have a podcast called A Millennial's Guide to Saving the World, where these ladies have graced it with their presence several times and many more to come. And yeah, that's pretty comprehensive. <laughs> but with the desire, will you mention your other podcast too? Because uh, it's... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yes, I, I also have a podcast called Horror Rapport that I host with my friend Aaron and we talk about sexuality basically the point was that I I'm very very interested in in sexuality conversations around sexuality intellectualizing sexuality um but didn't want to overwhelm my original podcast with that so that's my space to do that yeah my eighth house Aries can hold back and asking you (laughs) (laughs) awesome (laughs) and thank you guys for having me this was I feel my Mars feels very happy and fulfilled (laughs) it's our pleasure thank you for coming on the show yeah love having you so much and you can find all of us now (laughs) at www.cosmictonic.com kestrel's instagram is at (laughs) kessaru our instagram handle is at cosmic tonic and our twitter is cosmic underscore tonic and We'd like to thank everyone for being here and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.